they expanded it. Uh, Noblewood Drive, $1.9 million dollars out there in front of our driveway. Noblewood Drive, $1.2 million. We are delighted you're here. Amen? I'm glad about it. I don't know any other preacher got a $1.9 million street in front of his church. So I'm going to shout and celebrate it for a long time. And uh, I don't think anybody said Noblewood Drive more than me in the 20 years we've been here since James. Amen? I say it every morning. Amen? <laughs> But I thank God. I'm glad you're here. It's a joy to be alive today. It's a joy to be in the house of prayer. And it's a joy to know God and to know him as your personal Savior. Amen. And we're all moving through time. Moving through time and moving accelerated sometimes. And we don't recognize the accelerated pace of our lives. But we thank God that he gives us another day. And in each day, he gives us new mercy. New mercy. New mercy. Amen. We get the same old day, we get the same old routine, but we get new mercies that we can endure the same old routine. Amen. Well, I'm thankful to God. I'm glad to be here tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about an attribute of God. And an attribute of God is merely a quality of God, a quality, a characteristic. You have characteristics. Some of you like to laugh. Some of you frown. Some of you get angry. Some of you got a quick temper. God has, an att has attributes. His attribute, one of the attributes we're going to talk about is the attribute of mercy. He is a God of mercy. Amen? Not necessarily just a God of all these other things. He's a God of love. He's a God of wrath. He's a God of forgiveness. But he's a God of mercy. And we're going to look at mercy tonight. Mercy is, is not getting what you deserve. Amen? If you deserve a whooping, mercy is not giving you the whooping. Amen? Now you know that. Amen? Have mercy on me. Is that right? Because we don't want a whooping from God. Amen. We want mercy. And God can exact a whipping. And, and any time he did something, God will be justified with it. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God, amen, even in the midst of our sin, all we like sheep have gone astray and turned aside everyone who was own way. But God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Jesus came to take our whipping. Amen. That's mercy right there. Amen. Not only is he our Savior, but does he give us reconciliation? We took our whipping. How much could you pay your brother or sister to take your whipping when you were little? Not all the money in the world, huh? They say, uh uh, I'm going to tell it, huh? <laughs> there, those of you that know money that you could pay your brother or sister to take your whipping. And if they were take this one whipping, they wouldn't take another. Amen. But Jesus paid it all. So we're going to talk about mercy tonight, and I'm grateful to God to be here. I want to thank God for a really great day. I want to thank God, here from Deacon Woodrow, Sister Annette, oh, and his pastor. And we, we are invited <laughs> to Baton Rouge this year. Amen? Wow. Is that right? Yeah. We're invited to Baton Rouge to, uh, I believe it's Minister Perry, Pastor Perry. Wesley, not uh, Wesley. Yeah. Anyway, his pastor. We're invited to Baton Rouge at some time when we are ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're not rushing. We're not jumping. We're just going to get ready. Amen. And go on to Baton Rouge. We might have to make it a tour and swing on down there to see Brother, <laughs> see Brother Randall. Amen. I got a tour going on the bus tour to lose down a preaching tour. I love that. That's what I live for. Amen. That's better than 10 days. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And we got to go to the Lord after that in uh, the look at his mercy. Amen. And um, we'll look at that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you tonight for your goodness and your mercy. And for that mercy, oh God, we could never repay. You gave us grace and mercy, and you extended it to us in that while we were yet sinners, you sent Christ to die for us. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy mercy, oh God, morning by morning. New mercies our heart sees. Open now our heart for wisdom and knowledge and understanding and mercy. We thank you, we love you, we adore you. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to thank God. Uh, the song I thought I'd start out with, not to sing, but to talk about again, is a song of mercy. Because this man wrote a song, and when he wrote a song, his heart was heavy. He had lost his daughters. Uh, in a great ship accident when the ship hit another ship and went down. And the man I'm talking about is Horatio Spafford. That's P-P-A-F-O-R-D. Uh, Horatio Spafford wrote the song, It Is Well. 
It is well what? It is well with my soul. Because he had to endure pain and sorrow, and not just losing his daughters, but I, I, I looked up again, because I heard others tell the story. I wanted to get the story, so you have to really research. And since I love research, so I can tell the story accurately, I looked up the story of Horatio Spafford's life. And he had a difficult life. He was a, a prominent lawyer, so I could identify with that. I'm not prominent, but I'm a lawyer. Huh? <laughs> he was a prominent lawyer, and he lost his, he, his life was full of trauma and, tra and tragedy. And the first death of his only son occurred in 1871, and shortly followed the great uh, Chicago fire. You remember the Chicago fire allegedly started by Mrs. O'Leary's cow? Well, Horatio Spafford owned lots of land and the land was destroyed by the fire, he was financially ruined. So being a successful lawyer, even overnight, he was financially ruined because of the fire. It decimated all his business interests, and then in 1873, there was an economic downturn. What are you leading to? I'm leading to this point where tragedy after tragedy and hurt after hurt, it could only be the mercy of God that released him to live again. Amen? Because when you lose things like family members, it'll hurt you. And so he lost his, his son at, at an early age. Then he lost his money. Kind of sounds like Job, doesn't he? Yeah. And then here's the point where he writes the song. Because he was so decimated by the, by the loss of the Chicago fire, he said, we're going to Europe and start over. We're going to start over in Europe. So he sent his wife and he sent his four little girls ahead on a ship. And the, he said, I'm going to join you later because I'm, I'm tied up in some zoning issues. In, in Chicago. We know about zoning issues because across the street. And so he said, I'm tied up in some zoning issues and I'll join you later. Well, the ship went on out to sea and while it was sailing, it was the SS Bill D. Harvey, but at any rate, it, it clashed with another ship and sunk fast. His wife and four little girls were born. All of his girls died. And later, when he got the message, he said, a telegram came from the wife saying, saved alone. The girls are dead. And he caught the next vessel, the next vessel going. He joined his wife, and he went to, he said, tell me, Captain, when we get to the place where my little girls die, we get to the longitude and latitude, I want you to knock on my cabin and let me know. And the captain got to the longitude and latitude and said, this is the place where the ship went down. And he went out and stood on that balcony and wrote the song, It is well with my soul. When peace like a river huh, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, thou hast taught me to say, It is well, it is well with my soul. That's the God's mercy. When pain hits you like that, it's like an abscess on your heart. Our abscess is something that needs to be pricked and, 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 and getting down. It's swollen. Pain in your mind is swollen until the mercy of God grants you grace and favor to take that pain away. And when that pain could be taken away, he immortalized his feelings. This man was sent through feelings, and the feelings he went through, wretched. How do you lose four little girls? How do you deal with living and losing your family? But you know, God blessed him to write the song, and then later he would have, I think he would have three more children born to him. Amen. God, it's kind of a story like Job, because God replenished, and God paid him in a way, he gave him children again. And when you never think you can love again until you hold a newborn baby in your arms, and you say, This baby needs some love, and you start healing from that. That's mercy. That's mercy. Mercy when God grants you uh, the tr even mercy, light in the time of darkness. So we want to look at God's mercy because mercy is what we need. Mercy was present at the cross as well as justice, someone said. But justice demanded that Jesus pay the price. And until the price was paid, mercy couldn't do anything. Mercy said, my hands are tied. Until justice is paid off, and Jesus said, God said in the day that thou sin, I will surely die. And Jesus had to go and pay the price of death. But when he died, he became the propitiation and the mercy for our sins. Amen? And so in that regard, mercy was able to be extended to all who believe in Jesus Christ. Amen? 
All right, all right. Now let's, let's go further, deeper down and further here. Because I want to look at two aspects of mercy. We often give, um, in Psalms number 51, we often give David a, a fit for his time with Bathsheba. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Amen. Everybody talks about David and Bathsheba. Amen. Even if a preacher can't preach good, he knows about David and Bathsheba. Is that right? <laughs> we talk about David and Bathsheba. Well, I want to talk about Psalms 51 because David had to deal with his sin, but he could only deal with his sin through the mercies of God. We remember the story well, because we need not go over the whole details, but to say suffice it enough that David sinned, and he sinned against God, he sinned against himself, he sinned against Bathsheba, and he sinned against Uriah, for he had Uriah murdered to cover his sin up. Is that right? But we get to the book of uh, Psalms, number 51. We find David writing his heart out to get mercies of God. The very first thing he says is, have mercy. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Because I need mercy. I've done wrong. We know the prophet Nathan did come to David. Is that right? And David thought the sin was covered up. There's nothing like us acting crazy. Like we know we have forgotten something we've done. Hmm? What? Huh? So for a year, David, of course, had, uh, did not repent of his sin. Is that right? Uriah got killed in battle according to David's instructions. And David brought in Bathsheba, said, I'll marry you now. Your husband's dead, and it's covered up, and we'll forget about it. And here comes the prophet Nathan giving a parable. This is why we really learn what a parable is. First is a picture and a storyline. Then he flips the storyline and picture over, and it becomes a mirror. And you see yourself, and after the mirror, then he opens up a window of opportunity for you. So the prophet said, you know, that was this man who had uh, one ewe lamb and another man who had his neighbor had 90 and 9. Is that right? Mm -hmm. and, and the neighbor had a guest who came to his house and, and he would spare his own 99, went and took the one ewe lamb that was uh, like a member of the family, laid in this man, master's bosom, was just like a, a member of the family. And he slayed that, that lamb and gave food to his guests. And David was wrong. Is that right? Come on, you remember that. And David says, I've never the man should die. He said, you are that man. How'd you like a story like that? I'm going to tell you a story. He said, you are that man. <coughs> David said, he said, you, you had, David said, God told me, uh, Nathan said David to David, God told me, if you had uh, your wives and they weren't enough, I would have gladly given you more. I took you from her and the sheep, and now you insulted me by committing adultery and murder. After the sword will never leave your house. And David, of course, repented, and that's when he wrote the, the 51st number of Psalms. A good song to look at if you need to repent. Because we sin every day. And you know what? We think so little of our sinning is part of the landscape of our mind. I didn't do nothing wrong. Yes, you did. We talked about that Sunday. How many folks lied, huh? Have you gotten through the week without lying yet? Amen. That's when we preach Sunday. Yeah. Amen. Y'all don't want to hear this, but I'm going to preach it anyway. Amen. Because folk like to lie and call it part of the landscape of, what do we call it, political correctness, uh, spinning something to our favor. Well, at any rate, David writes the psalm. He says, have mercy upon me. Is that what he said? Uh, is that right? Yeah. right. Oh, God, according to what? Loving, Loving kindness. Yeah. According to, listen to this, the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. God has a multitude of mercies. And David says, I am guilty. What do you do when you're guilty? You fess up. Yeah. Most people don't. They try to lie their way out of that. But they have to learn even that one lie leads to another lie. And you're just going to lie your way deeper in. Is that right? Yeah. Grandma can tell you about lying. Is that right? Oh. Oh. If you sweat on your nose, you're going to be a thief. <laughs> Somebody used to say stuff like that. Grandma could look at you and say, nah, I'm going to beat it out of you. And they beat it out of you too. But God doesn't beat it out of you. He gives you an opportunity and space to repent. David says, Lord, you have a multitude of tender mercies, and by the multitude of those mercies, blot out, blot out, erase, erase, erase what? My transgression. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And he talks about transgressions because he doesn't talk about singular. Amen? Then he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my what? 
For the only way you can get mercy from God is verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. How can you lie and put it away? The lie just sits up there in your mind, sort of a little misty side and says, you lie. And it gets faints and it faints, but it's still there, huh? You know you lie. And until it comes to somebody challenge you, that, 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 that light and that writing becomes prominent. You lie. But years pass and we say, you lie. And it's faint and it's faint. Is that right? Huh? Y'all like to remember about your life? Huh? You yeah. forgot him? <laughs> well, anyway, David didn't forget his. He says, it's ever before me. I can't sleep. You've convicted me, especially when you get convicted. I mean, when you, nobody catches you, you say, okay, uh, but when they catch you, oh, Jesus, huh? Y'all don't want to say that because I'm going to say it to me. <laughs> All right? So he says, by well, God's my sin, against thee and thee only have I done this, and thy sin done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when I speak it, and be clear when thou judge it. Now, if your lie is not repented of, God will judge it. So the thing you want to do is repent. Amen? Yeah. And God's mercy is there for you. Now, let me just go a little further. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I want to go through all of it. He says, uh, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. God wants the truth. God is not about lies. Doesn't he say, Thou shalt not what? Is that right? Yes. But we lie anyway. I pray, huh? I was going to say, our president lies. He tells whatever is expedient. I don't know that we call him in a bald face lie. Huh? If it's a bald face lie, you just done lie, huh? But but as Congress lies, is that right? Yeah. yeah. And everybody seems to tell what is in their best interest, which is a lie. Yeah. Amen. Businesses lie. Exxon Mobil lies. They had all the pipe under the land and where was it? Arizona somewhere? Uh, and the pipe burst and all that. Like, those people didn't know they were living under an uh, oil pipe, flowing pipe, who would, would, would mess up their mess up their neighborhood and then make them sick. Yeah. yeah. They didn't know that. So somebody had to lie. I just didn't say nothing. A yeah. duty to speak when you owe a duty to. I mean, a duty to speak and then you owe you keep your mouth closed. That's as good as a lie, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I didn't know. <laughs> Boy, we can really get down. So here's David saying uh, here in verse 10. He says. Um, Create in me what? Oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and hold me with thy willingness of free spirit. In other words, Lord, I can't clean myself, and I know your mercy is available to me 24-7. Your, God's mercy is available to us 24-7. Our problem is we want to wait until the 23rd uh, hour and the 58th minute or 59th minute before 24 hours. We want to wait till the last minute before we call, right when we call, and then we fess up. So God, so David has to come to the terms and grips and say, I acknowledge my sin right now, and I want you to create within me a clean heart. And God does that for us. He forgives us of our sin. Is that right? right? Let me look at one more thing, and, and, and let me see if I hope you can get this <coughs> even better. In the 11th chapter of Luke, we find, we find some lepers. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And we find, let me see if we get it now very right quickly. As I said, 11, it's 17th chapter, I'm sorry. 17th chapter, 11th verse. 17th chapter of Luke, we have, we have 10 lepers at the 11th verse. Now, leper, leprosy was a loathsome disease. It was the result of sin. If you got cursed with leprosy, you sinned somewhere. That's what's in the Old Testament. Amen? And in the New Testament here, too. So leprosy with Israel was looked at as a loathsome, sin-driven curse and judgment by God. If you had leprosy. All right? No questions asked. You got leprosy, you did something evil. So these lepers, of course, were isolated and ostracized, meaning they couldn't live with normal people. When you had leprosy, you had to say, unclean, unclean, leprosy. And the people would grab their children and run and get away from you because they didn't want you to touch them with that loathsome disease of leprosy. So lepers lived in a colony. So we come to chapter 17 and verse 11, where there were 10 lepers. 
And they were together because they could only dwell among each other. But they, they heard that Jesus was coming by. And the passage starts out with Jesus on his way to Jerusalem, and he goes through Samaria. Amen? Most Jews, now watch this, wouldn't set foot in Samaria. It's like going into the project. Huh? He said, I ain't going to that. And Jews would say, the Samaritans are as dogs because they're half-breed people. We do not even want to touch their land. But Jesus would go where nobody would go. He loved people enough to forget about the label and to concern himself about the soul. And that's how we all got saved. He looked beyond our fault and saw our needs. And he said, like the woman who was at the well in, in the ch fourth chapter of John, Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. And so these ten lepers were there. He must needs go through Samaria. When he goes through that, they say, Master! They hollered with a loud voice at the top of their voice. Listen, if you had the loathsomeness of leprosy, you wanted relief. Fingers would fall off. Huh? Things just fall off, turn white, you smell bad, you look bad, nobody wanted to be around you. Your face drooped. Everything about you was loathsome. You reminded, you were reminded you were disease laden every time you looked in the mirror. And each morning you woke up, you were counting toes, hoping some was still there. They hollered at the top of their voices because Jesus was passing by. Jesus was passing by because he must needs go through Samaria, and he already knew who was there, who would need him, and the degree of healing they would need. That's mercy. They didn't know he was coming till he got there. Right. But when he got there, they were moved to holler out, Lord, have mercy on me. And Jesus didn't know that mercy was readily available, knew that his mercy was there, didn't address him. Well, what sin did you commit? Who are you? You know how we go through the litany of questions. Who's your mama and where you live? And I got to decide if I want to heal. He said, go show yourself to the priest. That was the last stage in the healing of leprosy. That was the last stage in the healing of leprosy. If you had leprosy and you were cleansed, you had to go show yourself to the priest. And then after a few days, show purification. Then you could rejoin. Your family. Jesus gave them the last day. He said, go show yourself to the priest. Now, if we had been there, and we had been one of the ten, we would have said, we didn't show ourselves to the priest. You ain't healed us yet. Is that what we said? Without one plus one mind. Amen. 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 Why are we going to the priest when we have been healed? Is that what we say? <clears throat> yes, you would say that. Yeah. Why am I on my way to the priest and you haven't done nothing for me, man? Is that what we say? Amen. All right, I just want to make sure we say that. Because I know many of us would not go to that beat, huh? We ain't used to that. Used to fussing, huh? And so he said, go show yourself to the priest. Now watch this, watch this. Ten lepers, all with debilitating disease, all with disfigurement to their faces and disfigurement to their limbs, all hollered out in a chorus together. Then they all turned, and as they were walking, watch this, the word of God overtook them, the mercy of God came upon them, and as they took the next step, mercy healed them, and they were healed when they walked out on the word of God. Amen? Amen. When they heard the word, faith came by hearing, hearing by the word of God, and they acted on what Jesus said. Yes. He unleashed the mercy in the fact that he said, go show yourself to the priest. Have enough faith to believe right now you're healed. Turn around, and the moment you turn around and start on that journey, my grace and mercy will overtake you. Is that right? And that mercy came as they moved. Boom! And boom, 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 their body was healed. All that loathsomeness of leprosy, whatever, maybe fingers grew back, whatever they did, they were made whole. They were made whole. And we know the story because only one out of the ten turned back and said thank you. Which means 90% of folk who get healed don't even remember Jesus. Right. Lying between their teeth talking about, I'm going to bless the Lord, wait till I get my money, I'm going to tie. I'd be rich if all the Negroes had told me that, did what they said. Amen! Right. You just wait. No, you're not going to do any better. 90% of folk who get blessed don't remember Jesus until they need him again. But mercy was present the moment they heard and turned to go and believe. And mercy took them and blessed them. We have mercy available to us right now. Whatever sin that leaves us with shame, whatever sin leaves us in a way uh, unrighteous before God. Whatever sin that we have committed that condemns us and shames us, God's mercy 
is available just like those words to overtake our sin. To wash us and to cleanse us and to take away the guilty sin. That's mercy. Mercy meant, in a sense, you didn't get the whooping. You sinned, but you didn't get the whooping you should have gotten. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Now, how many wouldn't try to talk their way out of a whooping? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Everybody would be standing in line. There's forgiveness over here, whooping over here. Which line are you standing? <laughs> forgiveness? Yeah. I ain't crazy. Huh? <laughs> Well, Lord, you know I just, I, you know I just want her ever came over me, huh? We think of something, wouldn't we? Try to lie on the spot if we could, amen? I said, you know you were guilty. All I want to hear you say is you confess. Amen? We like to think of excuse, well, you know, if so-and-so hadn't come over and so-and-so had come over, huh? We come up with all kind of hypothesis. The Lord said, I want to hear one thing. Are you sorry? Yes, I'm sorry. You're going to do it again? No! Amen? And some of us say, well, I think about it. Huh? <laughs> Addicted to sin and strongholds in your life. you got to be true. Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. Peter was in such a moment of truth when Jesus asked him, Peter, do you love me? Yeah. Is that what he asked him? Amen. Peter had denied the Lord how many times? Three. Three, Three times before the cock crowed. Twice. And the Lord had to rehabilitate him from that lie. Yeah. Amen? Because he said, you were with him. The, the maiden said, you were with him. He's like, no, I wasn't. Is that right, he said? Amen. And then he went to another one. Well, thou art a Galilean. No, I'm not. And he cursed. Yeah. He used some of those words for you. Huh? He said, I'm a fisherman, but I know how to curse. Yeah. I ain't no huh? disciple. And the cock said, huh? Uh, 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 huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> huh? The cock told the guy, said, I'm on time. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm on time. This is my cue. Yeah. And the cock came up. And then, of course, Peter had denied the Lord three times. Yeah. And now Jesus gets him over there when he says, if you any meat, and obviously they, they were out fishing and hadn't caught a thing, and he said, let your fish out, your nets down for a drought, they come and pick them. Do you love me? Huh? That's what somebody has to ask you sometime. Huh? Mm -hmm. Do you love me? Huh? He doesn't put it under force. <laughs> Amen. Because we would, wouldn't we? Amen. Mm -hmm. I done heard something. Is that when we come in? I done heard something. <laughs> I just want to know <laughs> before I knock you in. The Lord isn't like that. Right. He just simply said, do you love me? And the words were, Peter, do you agape me? Agape means, do you love me unconditionally? Yeah. Peter was reminded of the fact that he was a sinner and quick with his tongue and temperament and quick to lie. He says, Lord, I do not have not reached the highest level of love. Love is agape, phileo, and eros. And the highest love is uh, agape love, which is the way God loves us, unconditionally. So he said, Peter, do you, uh, do you agape me? He says, no, Lord, I phileo you. I'm not to the level of love I need to be. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you agape me? No, Lord, I phileo you. Peter, do you agape me? No, I phileo. Feed my lamb. Feed my sheep. Peter, I know you don't love me to the level where you need to, or you wouldn't have lied so much. But I want to tell you how I love you. I love you from where you are up to where you are to be. That's mercy. And that's the way God loves us. We have to look at our disabilities. We have to look at our sin. We have to look at the fact that we have our sin as an abomination to God and to our soul. And God looks beyond our sin. Because sin could not stand in the presence of God. If sin were in the presence of God and God hadn't taken the, the tongs of uh, the angel, hadn't taken the coal and touched uh, Isaiah's uh, lips, he would have just could be consumed. God had to, if Moses hadn't taken off his shoes, uh, the holiness of God would have struck him dead. The holiness of God cannot stand sin. And unless God prepares you for his presence, you can't stand in his presence. So God has to take away your iniquity or you cannot be there. Daniel said, uh, my covenant has turned to corruption that remained no strength in me. And then a hand touched me and set me about on my hands and knees. God's hands have to touch you, prepare you for his presence. If you stay sinful, his holiness will break out and kill you. Amen. Amen. So God says, I don't like sin. I hate sin. But I sure do love the sin. Amen. Amen. That's mercy. You would not make a distinction. I'm closing. If somebody denied you three times, and said, I don't know him. I don't know him. I ain't never known him. And you said, they've been in my house, Sister Jane, sat at my table, ate my food, 
and now you don't know me? Huh? Is that the way we feel? I know we feel that way. She's not violent. I am. Huh? Because I don't want to hurt somebody behind lying like that. That hurts me when you lie like that. But the Lord says, you lied on me, you said everything, you, you disowned me. I know it was a sin in you. And I love you anyway in spite of that sin in you. I'm looking beyond your faults to the kind of person you can be. And I want to lift you up and I want to bless you. Amen? That's what God does. That's mercy. That's mercy. Amen? Mercy is saying, I do not have to whip you even though I have the right to do so. How many mothers have in here have, have let the child go off of, off of not whipping them when you do they deserve the book? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Now, how many, how many fathers, uncles in here let, uh, take a, and, got, and got that whooping even though that person may have repented? <laughs> Men tend to, well, I'm going to whoop you until I feel good, huh? I don't care if it's too late to repent now. You shouldn't have all done it. Is that our theory? And mothers say, well, he, he said he wouldn't do it again, huh? <laughs> I'm sure telling the truth tonight. Well, God is loving you like a mother and a father. And he does not whip us when we deserve a whip. And mercy is God's mercy extended to you. Now, what I like about it is I quote. Every morning, he gives us his mercy. I don't know how he can do it, but God is infinite. 365 days in a year, every morning, new mercy. You got up this morning, you could think. You got up this morning, you could plan. You got up this morning, you had problem-solving analysis and the mental acuity to know what you needed to do in the day. Got to get, get your bath and get dressed put on these clothes and go see about it. Huh? God gave you that. That's mercy. And then if you woke up and you weren't sick, amen, confined to the bed, you say, get me out of here. I'm dying and laying down. That's a mercy. Huh? You go in there and, and sit in your easy chair and turn on the television, huh? That's mercy. Eat you some pancakes and oatmeal and uh, eggs and if they taste good to you, people don't have their sense of taste today. And you had a big appetite. Yeah. Then got a toothpick. <laughs> God loves you. Morning by morning, new mercies. You see, I thank God for his mercy. If he didn't love us, then we wouldn't have any mercy. If he treated us like we treat the world and like we treat each other, we wouldn't have any mercy to think about. We say everybody who lives in sin is going to die. I mean, he left it there. But those who believe on my son, who repent of their sins, I'm going to give them eternal life, and that life will be with me. Oh, we're going up yonder one day, yeah, and you'll yeah, really see what yeah. mercy can do for you. Mercy is down here every day, but when you get to glory, you're going to see what mercy is, giving you something that you really didn't deserve. That's grace, too. Grace is unmerited favor, and whippings and mercy is not whipping you, did, you deserve that you didn't get. If you could pass by hell right now and look in through the window, you see people getting justice without mercy. Because God whips and he never stops. You ever got a whip and you say, I'll be good, I'll be good, I'll be good, huh? You remember those statements when you were little? Oh, yes, you do. You got everybody said them. Because they'll think of it, whack, whack, huh? I'm just bringing that back because that's the era I grew up in. Amen. Now, today they say that's child abuse, but it didn't do abuse, huh? It abused us to help us to guide our feet in the steps of righteousness. But those lips would be coming. Whack! Well, he didn't even teach us good whip in the old days. How many grew up when teachers could whip? Huh? Almost everybody in here. Teachers said, come on, bend over, whatever, hold out your head. And they whack. Well, you wanted relief from that. And so you say, I'll be good, I'll be good. Mercy is saying, all right, I'm gonna stop. I'm not gonna give you ten licks, I'm gonna give you five. Uh, I'm not gonna give you five, I'm gonna give you two. And some of us knew how to fake. Oh, they hurt, huh? And it didn't really hurt that much. Dra dra dramatics, Andrea, dramatics. But God loves us enough to say, I'm not going to with you. Jesus paid it on the cross, and I'm going to bless you now with mercy and favor you don't deserve. We'll go home tonight and thank God. Thank God we were dropped off on this side of the planet. Thank God we were not born in Africa where there's starvation and hunger and over a quarter million people die every week where there's disease rampant, there's no food, and you bathe in the water that animals bathe in. Yeah, yeah. Talking about the mother country, I don't want to go there. Amen? Yeah. I want to stay here where my folks put in all this labor for free. 
I'm going to get some of the benefits. Amen. 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 But God bless you to be on this side of the planet and wakes you up to morning by morning. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his love. Thank God for these lepers who turned and went. And when they turned and went, 24-7 mercy caught up with them. And only one had the sense of mind to come back and say thank you. And he was a Samaritan, which symbolized he wasn't in the church. A whole lot of church folk get blessed and forget about it. It's only sometimes the sinner who says, you know, I've been so poor and homeless all my life. i got to go back and thank that man for giving me a house. The sinner has more going for him because he recognized how destitute his life is without the mercy of God. May God bless you.